course, what we're going to do. Right? So we've seen this. But the point is, there's a small bind here, right? We are saying these two attributes are implicit for stock on the ERT. Right? Now, how do we show that the primary key for stock is warehouse ID product ID? Right? What is the notation we use for a primary key in this course? Yeah, the hash sign, the number sign. Product ID, warehouse ID, right? So obviously we have to indicate the primary key for stock. And the primary key for stock is warehouse ID, product ID. But we don't show those two things at all. So how do you indicate the primary key? Right? So there's one other notation that will be coming that will be used for this. That is the tilde. Right? So you put those tilde signs, right? And the tilde sign is called key migration. Okay, the, the term that they use for that is called key migration in the sense that you're saying by putting the tilde sign, I'm saying that the primary key for stock includes the primary key for product. Right? By putting the tilde sign, I'm saying this is borrowing the product's ID as part of its primary key. And it's also borrowing the warehouse ID as part of its primary key. So that notation, the tilde notation that you see on the line, the tilde notation is called uh, key migration. Okay. So that's what that is. So when you look at this diagram, you see somebody asks you the question, what is the primary key of stock? Right. The first thing you look for is, does stock have any attributes with the primary key sign? Okay. If so, that is part of the primary key. And then you look and see, are there any tilde signs? If so, add the primary keys of those entities as well and make up the primary key for stock. In this case, stock doesn't have any attribute of its own that says primary key. So the primary key is only those two. Question? Okay. So the primary key for stock is warehouse ID, product ID. That's what is indicated in this diagram. Okay. So that's key migration. Okay. So the general notation here for key migration you're seeing here. So you've got an entity called X with X ID, entity called Y with Y ID. You've got an associative entity A. Now why did that associative entity A come up? Why do you think it might have come up? Because there was a many to many between X and Y. Right? X and Y had a many to many relationship. So we said, okay, let's follow the rule and create a new entity type. We're calling it A. Right? And in this case, we are just making up the key for A by adding the keys of X and Y. Right? So we take X ID, Y ID, we migrate the keys and that's what the tilde notation says. So the primary key of A is X ID plus Y ID. Okay. Uh, so now, there's another example here of library context. You've got, a, you've got lots of books in the library, you've got lots of borrowers. And of course, people borrow books, borrowers borrow books. Right, so you create this, it's a many to many. A book may be borrowed many times and a borrower may borrow many books, so that's a many to many. So we create this new associative entity called loan. That's a good name for it, right? And what is the primary key for loan, right? It has its own key field called date borrowed. So that's clearly part of the primary key. And then it's got two tildes. So we also know that its primary key is going to come from book and from borrower. Okay? Yeah. In the associated uh, entity, would the, the primary key with the other two always be primary key of that one? Not always. Not always, but in, in these cases it is. When you see the tilde, that means you're using it. But there could be situations when you're not using it. Okay? However, whether you're using it or not, those are still attributes for sure. Because it's a one to many, those are still attributes. The only question is, are they part of the key or not? So far, we are seeing that they're part of the key in all the examples. Okay? So, date borrowed plus book ID plus borrower ID together form the key. Okay? Why do I need date borrowed? Why not just have book ID and borrower ID? Yep. You may take the same book out many times. Right, I borrow it today, return it 10 days later. Next month, again, I borrow it and I return it. 
So the same borrower took the book out many times. So now you, how do you distinguish between this borrowing and that borrowing? The only way is the date on which it was borrowed. Okay. Now is the, does that pose a problem? Is this adequate or is it is this foolproof? Putting the date borrowed does it make it foolproof? No. Extreme case. I borrow it in the morning. You know, I borrow it at nine, return it at ten, and then again I borrow it at two and return it at three. This can't take care of that, right? So you really want to know exactly at what time it was borrowed. But we are saying that's sort of extreme. Just you just have to be aware. Right. So this is what uh, you know. This is one of the kind of situations you said. What if the same actor plays playing multiple roles in a movie? Right. So you need to do something to take care of that. This doesn't really work. This solution doesn't work. But another solution we'll talk about. Okay. So so this is another example of key migration. Okay. So we saw that. What can make this inadequate? Well. If in one day, if the person does many times, then there's a problem. Okay. Now this is another option. You may say, well, I choose to give C its own key. Right? In other words, I'm saying I'm not interested in borrowing the keys of X and Y to make up a key for C. I'm just going to give it its own ID. Right? So whenever you see an entity with the primary key being entity name space ID, Right. Whenever you see that, you assume that, well, that's the primary key, nothing else. Okay. That's just the convention we're following in this course. Right. So the, you see CID, that's the primary key, nothing else. Why? Because entity name ID, if it exists, then that is the primary key. Okay. So in this case, we're not resorting to key migration, nothing. How many attributes does C have? Three. One to many relationship, implicit borrowing. Okay, so the the you know X I D and Y I D are still there in C, right? Just because there is no key migration, it doesn't mean they are not there. They are there. It's just that they are not part of the key. Okay, so remember that always. They are just not part of the key because you chose to give it its own key. That's what you would do in the movie example that you pointed out earlier, right? In the movie example, you would say, well, that relationship you're going to say, uh, you know. Uh, Whoever is the guy who played Luke Skywalker in Star Wars 1, uh, the same person also played something else in Star Wars 1. Same actor playing multiple roles in the same movie. You'll say, well, that is role 1, this is role 2. And you distinguish between the two. Okay? Okay? So this is the point I was trying to make. If an entity has a field named entity name underscore ID, or not underscore, just space ID, you know, that's the way the book has it, then that's the primary key. So, if you see a diagram in which you've got an entity C, it has got its own primary key hash and name of the entity ID, and then it also has tildes. What would that mean? It would mean the author screwed up. That's a mistake. Okay, that cannot happen because you're saying it has its own primary key, and then you're having uh, migrations. That's a mistake. Unfortunately, that mistake exists in the book in a couple of places. Okay, that mistake exists in the book a couple of places. I was completely confused. I emailed the author and he said, yeah, I accept it's a mistake. Okay, so now we know that that's a mistake and I'll point it out in a couple of diagrams where it exists. Okay, so if it has its own key, then there's no need to migrate anything. Okay, uh, we've seen this. Right? This is the point I was trying to make. XID and YID are still implied attributes of C. It's just that they're not part of the key, that's all. Okay, so these are the basic options for creating primary keys. One is construct from the keys of participating entities, like we saw in the stock example, or add additional attributes in addition to that. And this example we saw where? In the loan library example, right? We said date borrow. Right? We said I'm going to take the book ID, I'm going to take the borrower ID, but I'm also going to put the date borrow. So we saw that. And give the associative entity its own primary key. That's what we saw in the last example. These are the basic options for making keys for prime uh, associative entities. Okay. In the book, you'll see that all these options occur at different points. Right. Typically, you will do this when the associative entity is really made up of a big association, in the sense that five entities are participating in the relationship. 
right? In that case, making a primary key with you know X ID, Y ID, A ID, B ID, C ID, uh, you know, etc. That makes the primary key too complex. Then you say, let me give it its own ID. Okay, that's when you'll use this this part. Okay, uh, examples of these situations. Well, let's skip that. We've seen examples. You can make up examples of your own. Okay, so now looking at ternary relationships. Uh, this is an example of a ternary relationship. It's not an ER diagram, right? I'm just saying there are suppliers, there are parts, there are ship projects, and a shipment instance really connects three of them, right? I'm saying shipment two was made by supplier S3 to project P1, uh, sorry, to uh, of part P1 to project P2, right? So this instance is connecting these three. Instance of is connecting these three instances, and that instance of shipment is connecting those three instances. Just giving you an example. Okay. Uh, so the ER diagram for this would be, in the case of ternary relationships, there is no direct notation to show ternary relationships. Right. So what we'll always do in the case of any uh, relationship above uh, three and above is directly create an associative entity. Okay. So in this case, what we're going to do is to directly create an entity type called shipment. Okay. And then show that it is connected to all these three. Right. So simply it becomes three binary relationships with a new entity type. Right. So shipment is by a supplier of a part to a project. That's it. Okay. And in this case, I'm saying that you may have projects with no shipments, suppliers with no shipments, parts with no shipments, that's why one is doing that. But of course, every shipment must be of one of all of these. So that's why. And the same thing, you're seeing the crow foot on, on shipment. Okay. So that's this is the rule that we'll follow. And most of the time you'll see ternary relationships have their own ID, shipment ID in this case. How many attributes does shipment have? Plus three, seven. Right? One too many. It has seven attributes. We are seeing only four of them. But obviously, given a shipment, you have to know who is the supplier, what is the part, and what is the project. So those three attributes are already there. Right? So you can see now how this avoids clutter. Right? And you will see a box with seven things written inside, not needed. You wrote four, but the other three are implicit. Okay? So this really has seven attributes. Shipment. Why are there no key migrations shown on this diagram? Because, because it has its own key. Right? It has its own key, shipment ID. Right? So no point in showing key migrations. Those attributes are still there, they're just not part of the key, that's all. Okay? Because shipment ID, it says entity name ID, that's its own key. Now, what are the other options we have for primary key for shipment? One option is to give it its own key. Right? Another option might be to construct the key out of all of those three. In you know, supplier number, part number, project number together. You could make a key out of that. Would there be a problem with that? Would there be a problem if we said the primary key for shipment is supplier number, part, supplier ID, part ID, project ID? Would that work or would it be a problem? Right, same supplier supplies the same project to this, uh, supplies the same part to the same project many times. Today I supply 100 units to this same project. Tomorrow I supply 200 units of the same part to the same project again. Right, if you made that the key, you won't be allowed to supply, I mean, you won't be able to store it. Right, because key can occur only once, so I'll be either able to store today's shipment or tomorrow's shipment, but not both. That's obviously not acceptable. So to break that, you would have to add some other field, like you know, date and time of shipment or date of shipment or something you'd have to add, and that'll make the primary key unwieldy. Which is why we said, let's give it its own primary key. Okay, so, uh, so those are the real options. Its own primary key or construct with others implications. We've spoken about this. 
Right? So this is the option. If you try to construct it out of all of these, then you have to add one more field, which is the date shift or time shift or something. Okay? Then there is this problem. Okay. So we spoke about all of this. Okay. Now final part. Uh, we'll be talking about something that you have not covered in the previous course, I think. Right? And that is the concept of supertypes and subtypes of entities. Okay? So you've got entity types, but of course entity types can be further classified always. Right? In the real world, there's a lot of classification that goes on. Right? Not all students are of are students. You say, well, these are uh, you know freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, or graduate students, undergraduate students. There are different ways of classifying them. So here we just take a very simple example. You've got person. Right? And the person entity type may be further subclassified into male and female. Well, I should have probably said male person, female person, right? uh, to be more specific. Right? Now, these are what? These are also entity types. Right? Why are they entity types? Why do I say male is an entity type and not an instance? Because there are lots of you know, males and females around. There are instances of these, right? So these are also entity types. Male and female are not instances of the type person. They are subtypes. They are called subtypes. Right? And I think you didn't discuss this in Enterprise 1, did you? Concept of subtype. This is important because you're going to see a lot of it in, in this course. Okay? So these are called subtypes, which is a type that sort of belongs <coughs> to another type. Okay? So we'll see examples as we go forward. Right? So clearly, uh, you know, these are instances of male, those are instances of female. Right? But they are also instances of person. Right? Because every male is a person, every female is a person as per this diagram. And therefore, any instances of these are also instances of the supertype. Right? So John Smith is a male, John Smith is also a person, and so on. Okay? So let's Look up, uh, come up with some examples of super and subtypes. Any examples? I give male, you know, this person, male, female, and student. Those two are gone. Any others? Excellent, excellent. Professor, he says, you could have professors further subclassified, full time, part time. Uh, whatever, tenured, untenured, many different ways you can classify. Excellent. Any others? Yes. Yeah. An athlete is general all athletes. Could be college athlete, professional athlete, etc. Et yeah. Even students can be classified in different ways as uh, uh, you know, uh, a resident student and a day scholar, a commuter. Commuter versus resident. That's another classification of student. Right? So there are many different ways in which you can classify entity types further into other entity types. Right? In fact, there's no end to this classification. You can classify it in infinite number of ways. Right? Now what you choose to do and what you choose not to do depends upon the needs of the application. Right? The organization has a need to know certain things. It's only from that context that you say, okay, I'm interested in this, I'm not interested in this. You know, you can classify students into rich students and poor students, okay? But that may not be of interest to the organization, okay? Maybe when you're talking about financial aid and so on, but it may not be sometimes, okay? Or violent students and non-violent students. That <laughs> university system may not officially try to record all of that, okay? So you've got uh, subclassifications, okay? No sub, yeah. Right, you could do that also. What she's saying is, this is a good question. She's saying, you want to create a subtype, you can do it this way. But what she's saying is, I don't see the difference between creating a subtype or why not person just have an attribute called gender, right? And gender could be male or female, that's it, done. Right? So why would you, why would you want to create subtypes when you can just handle it through gender? Okay? One explanation would be, well, subtypes sometimes have their own attributes, 
which the super type doesn't have. Okay? And male may have certain attributes, female may have certain other attributes which are different. Right? So in that case, you want to keep track of those separate attributes, create a subtype. Sometimes subtypes have their own relationships. Okay? That uh, you know, one subtype is related to certain entities, the other subtype is not related to certain entities. So in that case, you may want to separate it out. For example, you know, female may have a relationship to a gynecologist. You know, you have another doctor, gynecologist, you know, doctor and then further subclassified. And then this subtype may have a relationship with that, whereas the other entity has no relationship. So then you will put it. If it's not important, don't. Keep it simple. Just put it as gender, be done with it. Excellent question. Okay. Uh, so now we have to be clear that subtypes are different from instances. Okay, subtypes are themselves types, which means they can have their own instances, whereas instances are not types. So we shouldn't get confused between subtype and instance. Okay, this point I already spoke about. Every instance of a subtype is also an instance of the supertype. In the sense we said John Smith is a male person. Here I switched to person. I just didn't put male and female. John Smith is a male person, but John Smith is also a person. Okay, sometimes that is represented as the easel relationship. Now you don't have to show this in any of the documents. This is not part of the ER notation. I just put it in there. So maybe I can make it a little bit color. Okay. This is just something that we can Okay. Uh, and of course, super and subtypes are both types, so they will have their own instances. But remember, female person and male person are not instances of person. Instances of person are these, right? These are subtypes because they are themselves types. Okay, that's what I was trying to. Uh, okay, let's take a look at this situation here and try to see what kind of relationship it is. Okay, university, Seton Hall University. Is that a type instance relationship or a super type subtype relationship? It's a type instance, right? University is the type, Seton Hall University is an instance of university. It's not a subtype. Seton Hall University is not a type, it's just an instance. Okay? So that is clear. First one, the answer is type instance. Okay? Animal cat. Super type subtype. Right? Because animal is a type, cat is also a type. Okay? Well, depends on the context you know sometimes you may say i'm not really interested in cats i'm only want, i only want to keep the different types of animals right so in that case animal might be the type and cat might be just be an instance but if we are interested in specific animals right actual living creatures which are you know walking around and biting and so on then you you will say well cat is also a type so in which case animal is a type and cat is a subtype okay so this one has dual interpretations, but we have to be sure of understanding both of those interpretations. Okay. How about Seton Hall University Stillman School? Neither of them is a type. Both are instances. Right? Seton Hall University is not a type. And Stillman School is not a type. Both are instances. So really it's it's out of the purview of this whole discussion altogether. Okay? That's one of those Devious questions. Okay. But they are all instances. Right? And not, Seton Hall University itself is an instance. Right? Arts and School of Arts and Sciences, School, Business School are instances and they are just connected. Right? These are instances of school. This is an instance of university. Right? So universities have schools. That is the relationship. And we are talking about this university has these schools. Okay, so this is not neither. It's not type instance, it's not super type subtype. Okay, it's just instance instance. There's not even a column here to talk about. Okay. How about uh, Stillman School and me? It's the same thing as the previous one. I'm an instance, Seton Hall, you know, Stillman School is an instance. So it's, you know, it's irrelevant. Okay, so it's irrelevant. Uh, gender, female. It could be super type subtype. Right, because, uh, oh no, sorry, it's not super type subtype, it's just type instance. Right? This is tricky again. Why do I say type instance? Okay, gender is a type. 
And you may say female and male are instances of the type. Okay. Now can you say female is a type? In this context you can't say female is a type. You may say well uh, that's an example of female. Right? But that's not relevant in this context. It's not good because if she is an example of, of the subtype then she should also be an instance of the supertype. Right? She is clearly not an instance of gender. She is an instance of person. Right? So when in this context, when you say gender, right, gender is just a type which has two values, female and male. Though they are two instances. Now in this context, female is not a type. Right? Because an instance of female should also be an instance of gender. That would not be true in this context. Okay? So this is also, uh, this is really here. It's a type instance example. It's not a super type subtype example. Okay. How about male John Doe? Type. type instance. There's really no ambiguity there. Order, purchase order. Uh, super type subtype. Right? Because order is a super type. You may have purchase orders and sales orders. Okay, that's also type. And then you have specific purchase orders, you know, the thousand purchase orders that you have. Right? So I would say this is super type subtype. Okay, so uh, I think you know you should take a look at the slides, sit down, think, you know, break your head and so on, and be very clear with this with this concept. Okay, so some of them have multiple interpretations, some of them don't. Okay, so this is just the answers that I came up with. Okay, so th these are the discussions we had. So this is all the discussions we had. So maybe it's worthwhile for you to go back and and see why. Uh, each of these is right or wrong or you agree or disagree with these. Okay. Of course types don't have just to go to two levels. It could be multiple hierarchy. You know, it could be a hierarchy that goes deeper and deeper. For example, you've got university which has got a university ID and university name and then you've got state universities and private universities. Right? Now within private universities you may have parochial universities and other kinds of universities. Okay, parochial in the sense of being run by a parish like us, like Seton Hall. Okay, so you could have, you know, the hierarchy stretching as deep as necessary. Okay, and this private university may have three subtypes, but parochial may have some other subtypes. We don't know. Right, so it's a hierarchy. It can go as deep as required to represent what is needed. And we'll see lots of class hierarchies in the diagrams that we look at. Okay. Now another important point when you talk about supertypes and subtypes is the concept of inheritance. Okay? In the sense that <coughs> attributes of the supertypes are automatically inherited as attributes of the subtypes. Okay? So you've got university ID in university name as attributes of university. Therefore, those two are also attributes of state university, private university, and parochial university. Attributes are simply inherited. Makes sense, right? Because we are saying every university has an ID and a name, and every private university is a, is a university, so it should also have an ID and a name. Okay, so that's what they call as attribute inheritance. Attributes are inherited by the subtypes, and therefore they are not explicitly shown inside the subtypes. It's implied. Okay, so then you can have the question of how many attributes does each of these have? How many attributes does university have? Two. University has two attributes. State university has three. It got two from university and it's got one of its own. Private and parochial have two. Okay? So they didn't inherit the state name because that belongs only to state university and maybe its subtypes. If there are subtypes of state university, they will have state name as well. Okay? So this is the idea and of course all of this is uh, recapped in this slide. It does. Parochial, parochial has two. University has only two. Right? University has only two. So parochial got those. Private got those. And two private parochial got those. So this, these have only the attributes of university. Only state has an extra attribute of its own. So it got the two from university. And it got its own state state name. Okay? So that, that's just how the inheritance of attributes works. 
Okay, then there's another concept that we have to look at. Whether the subtypes overlap or do not overlap. Okay, so in this example, for example, this is an example of a non-overlapping subtypes. Okay, example of non-overlapping subtypes. It's clear what's going on here. A person can be a male or a female. It's not possible to be both. Okay, so that means the subtypes don't overlap. An instance can belong to this or can belong to that, but not to both. Okay, but there are some situations where an instance may belong to multiple subtypes. Okay, so we need to have a separate notation for that. Now, till now, the examples we have looked at are all non overlap. Okay, so in this case, you might be able to classify this entity type person in many different ways. Right, you may classify them by gender as in male and female, but you may also classify them by their citizenship, citizen and non-citizen, right? But now you see that there are overlaps between these two could be allowed. You could have a female citizen, a female non-citizen, male citizen, male non-citizen. So one particular instance, right, maybe me, would be an example of a male citizen. I belong to this subtype, I also belong to this other subtype. In this case, it's not exclusive. Uh, uh, it's not uh, mutually exclusive. It's overlapping. Okay. Now, the notation that we have used so far indicates non-overlapping subtypes. Okay. This is the default notation, non-overlapping. When you want to have overlapping, then you use this notation. Okay. Uh, so, the, the crux of this notation is you've got unnamed rectangles. Right? So you've got this unnamed rectangle surrounding male and female, and you've got an unnamed rectangle surrounding citizen and non-citizen. Okay? So any entity types that occur within unnamed rectangles are mutually exclusive. Meaning there is no overlap possible between entity types that belong to the same rectangle. So male and female are mutually exclusive, citizen and non-citizen are mutually exclusive. You can't have a person who's both a citizen and a non-citizen at the same time. So inside a rectangle, mutually exclusive, but across rectangles, overlap is allowed. Okay, an instance could belong to one of these and also belong to one of these. That's allowed. Okay, so that's what um, is shown here. Can be an instance of this group and also be an instance of that group. And the key to the notation, as I pointed out, is the unnamed rectangle that surrounds other subtypes. Example of overlapping subtypes. Non-overlapping, easy. How about an example of overlapping subtypes? You can borrow from my example. Married, unmarried. That's just another way of classifying people, right? You can classify them as female, male, citizen, non-citizen, married, unmarried, and a person could belong to one of each of these categories. Okay. So whenever you have a supertype that can be classified into subtypes in many different ways, then you have the possibility for overlap. Okay? And of course that occurs in business models when you see, you see that you want to classify things in many different ways, so overlapping subtypes are quite common. Okay? So that's, that's a good example. <coughs> okay? Finally, we'll talk about relationship naming. Right? You've seen that we've given names to relationships, right? And this is something you did not do in the earlier course. Now, names and relationships are important because they give, they, they make us, help us to understand the diagram. In a familiar context, big deal. You know, student, course, section, we understand all that. Nobody needs to give names to those relationships. But if you're looking at an unfamiliar domain, then the names of the relationships are very important. Another context when a name of a relationship is important is when two entities are connected by multiple relationships. Like we saw, right? Employee and uh, you know, manage, department has employee as its manager, and a department has employees who are just employees within the department, right? So there are two relationships, and now you have to give a meaning. You have to give a name to indicate what each of them means, right? That's what naming of relationship is all about. So you're seeing the names here. So there's obviously a name on one side and a name on the other side as well, and we'll see how to interpret these names. 
Okay? Now, we want to give the names in such a way that you can read the diagram like an English sentence. Right? You can read the diagram like a proper English sentence. And that's what the naming convention really is. Right? So given this relationship, the way you can read it is, I'm going to first look at, read it in this direction, shipment to postal address. So I can say each shipment, which is the name of the entity. Right? So just put each, put the name of the first entity. Then depending on the line, you know, in this case, the line is solid. If it is solid, I say must be. If it is not solid, I say maybe. Right? So in this case, I know each shipment must be because of the solid line. And then I simply put the name of the relationship, shipped from. Right? And then I say, depending on whether there's a crow, crow foot or not, if it's a crow foot, I, uh, if there's no crow foot, I say one and only one. If there is a crow foot, I say many. And then I just put the name of the other entity. Type. Right? So you've taken the diagram and converted it into a proper English sentence. You can, in fact, give a diagram to a computer, and the computer can spit out all the business rules in English. Grammatical English sentences. Almost. Because I have to put, uh, you know, uh, if it's many, then you'd have to put postal addresses. Okay, that place, it might be a little tricky to be grammatic. But other than that, you can convert into a proper sentence. Okay, similarly, you can read the bottom in the similar way, reading it in the other direction from postal address. The each postal address must be because of the solid line here, the source of, which is just the name of the relationship, one or more because of the uh, uh, Crowfoot shipment, which is the name of the entity. The only thing we added here is shipments. We made it plural just to be grammatical. Other than that, it's just spewed out. Okay? So this is just the, uh, so we choose names in such a way that this sentence will be grammatical. So that's the idea. This is just the logic of how that is done in a generic way. There we saw an example. Here is the generic way in which you do this, how you read a relationship. You say each, and then you put the first entity. And then you put must be or maybe depending upon dash line or solid line. Then you put the name of the relationship. And again, you put one or more or one or only one depending upon Crowfoot or not. And then you put the name of the second entity. Okay, So that way, your uh, you can read the relationship and understand it exactly in English. Okay. So that is a naming convention. You name relationships in such a way that this sentence will make sense. Okay. So that's, that is the way in which all of the relationships in the book have been named. Okay. Final part of notation. I forgot that. There's one more. Okay. Take a look at this diagram. Right. In this diagram, you see Inventory item, forget about the subtypes and all that. You see inventory item, and then you see facility and container. Right? Now, what this is saying is an inventory item can be located at a facility. Right? That's what you see here with the located uh, thing here. Right? Inventory item can be located at a facility, and an inventory item can be located within a container. Okay? So it's both. But what the rule says is an inventory item can either have this relationship or have the other relationship. It can't have both of them simultaneously. That's clear, right? You have an inventory item. It might be just in a facility or it could be in a container. right? And the container would be in the facility. So you either keep track of this or keep track of that, but not both. right? So that is what that exclusive arc is saying. You, know, you see the small arc out there, uh, this arc here going down. That is the exclusive arc, and that is saying that only one of these relationships is possible at any point in time. Okay, that's just new notation. Uh, that, that's what this is. Okay, so that's the final part of notation. We are done with notation. Now we'll start looking at complex diagrams. Initially, of course, you know, I'll just keep trying to connect back and make sure we understand the notation. Afterwards, I'll assume that you understand it, and we'll just look at the diagram for the business rules. Okay, so that's it. We are done. Um, I, I hope you all submitted your assignments on Blackboard. I haven't looked at it yet. I'll take a look at it today. And for the next class, I haven't posted an assignment, but it's already. Uh, you know, pretty soon you'll see the assignment. Okay. Now it's 12:30 almost. So at 12:30, this lecture will become available to you on Blackboard. 
right? So you can take a look at it. Okay. See you next week. What is that? Uh, next week you may not need. The following week, yes. No, actually bring your laptop next week, please, because we'll install the software. Okay. So please bring your laptops for next week.